Welcome back to the program. You're watching Newsnight. I want to read some of your feedback right now. And let me start with the SMS line 22422. You don't give us your name or where you're texting in from, but uh, you say, fully agree with Dr. Kituyu on strengthening agriculture and reinventing cooperatives. Most of all, having zero tolerance on corruption is the cure Kenya needs. Paul Wanyoike, Dr. wants to know, thank you for your views. Would you indicate which sectors of the economy you would like to focus on if you get into that seat and why, okay? Um, Bethwell from uh, Kitale says, Dr. Kitui, you are a force to reckon with come 2022. Who is saying that you've been campaigning in Kakamega and back in Bakalo alone? Okay, have you been restricting your campaigns? Um, San Nixon Dugire from uh, Kindaruma says, who do you intend to nominate as your running mate? Or would you consider picking a woman as a running mate? Uh, Musioka is asking, can our Kenyan economy really sustain 47 counties? Should we think of reverting back to the eight provinces and retain them as centers of uh, devotion? Devolution. Centers of Devolution. This is from Musioka. Uh, and an SMS here, an interesting one, actually two. Let me just read them. Uh, no, tweets rather. Engineer Oketch on Twitter says, why can't Dr. Muhisa engage the president? As former Untad Secretary General, he must have his number on how to fix the economy so that Kenyans can get a rough idea of what his leadership style would look like uh, rather than, you know, waiting for later. And one viewer also is asking this question this evening, Dr. Akitu. He says, very well spoken guest in studio, but I want to know from him on how he will, his message will resonate with the masses uh, because at the moment it seems elitist in delivery. Maybe we start with that last question. Uh, the last question, you know, uh, what I've been talking about economic models and bottom up is in response to the questions you're asking me. You did not ask me, talk to the Kenyan public about the economic problems. Mm -hmm. I will have talked about starting with the fragile sectors of society, disappearing livelihoods in small and medium enterprise, how these people have to be found new jobs and it will be retooled to be able to do new jobs. But I was responding to specific questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are asking me economic elitist questions. Maybe it's a viewer who's watched answers. you on the campaign trail. But those are not the questions that I'm confronting when I sit peop with people. Uh, like I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. My first meeting was in Matuga constituency. And I sat under a large mango tree in the homestead of Amze called uh, Muse Kushinda. He brought neighbors and other uh, eminent leaders from the community. And they were asking me, we have two key problems that we don't understand how we can deal with. Mm -hmm. The first problem we have is the Kenya army recruits people are going to a certain height. But the average mudigo is short of stature. And if we have children, who cannot enjoy the citizen right of qualifying to join the disciplined forces mm -hmm. because of size. And it led me into a discussion about how in the colonial state, the soldier was recruited as a mule, tall, with unbroken teeth, physically able to run long, di long distances, because they were carrying luggage from the coast into the interior. Today we have helicopters, we have railways, we have buses, we have trucks and, uh, and, and uh, fixing planes. Why do we still have the mentality of 19th century that we look for a mule as qualification to become a soldier, which is denying the digo a citizen right? And I told them, you have opened my eyes. And if I become president, one of the first things I'll do is to bring the rule book on security recruitment into the 21st century. So it's not just me talking to people. It's also learning from them through their personal experiences. A second thing is that many people who believe in Usirikina are persons without a good education. Many of them are too old to go into schools today. But then we don't have any way of communicating with people that we can get over this. How can government help us when they seem to look down at us as illiterate witchcraft believers? So that break of communication between the elite and the people who feel inadequate even if they now are too believing in witchcraft. It's a challenge that we have to increase communication about. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a laguna in the communication in a language that captures the imagination of the media and the reality of talking to persons who are vulnerable and shamed by their inadequacies by where they live.
And, so, and you so, feel that's a balance you've been able to, to th That is walk. an area I am growing into. But allow me to answer a question that was raised there sure. before. And, and, it and was a question about you. There's a meeting I had with representatives of younger leaders in civil society where I said, to my mind, a political party of the 21st century cannot be the old brick and mortar castle where all the men have set themselves up the constitution and manifesto and they go and ask civil society activists and youths to come and join their party, we will be good for you. To me, the political party of the 21st century has to be a canvas, a space where young people, civil society activists, are invited to come and co-author the agenda. Write your dreams here. You know, they, they are the WhatsApp generation. They can like you, they can unlike you. Today, they befriend you, tomorrow they unfriend you. For them to be sustained as your friends, they must go on what you're trying to do. And what we are trying to do, I, we are setting up in our party, we'll be having a youth league, but I it's not just a youth league. I was going to ask you about your party specifically. Yes. yes, we are saying that one of the key areas of policy has to mobilize younger people's engagement, not as foot soldiers of our struggle, but as co-authors of the narrative. Not as people who are working for their leaders, but as part of the leadership with our commitment of younger people being part of cabinet and government at different levels. So gender, civil society, youth are a reality that we own up and we promise our commitment to. Avia wanted to know whether it's possible for you to reach out to the president and tell him some of the recommendations you have. For I, example, the yeah, large infrastructure projects. Yes, yes, projects. I, I can, come, can, I can, I can come back to this. There are some things I talked to the president which cannot be discussed uh, beyond the closed doors of our confidential meetings. But the so reality that I can share is that two times when I was Secretary General of Anctad, I organized an international team of experts who have been involved in development, which included a former managing director of the World Bank, who is a Chinese professor and the author of the Ethiopian model of uh, labor-intensive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It included a former minister of industrialization of India and uh, two other key uh, important uh, interlocutors on development. And we had a retreat with the president of Kenya, the deputy president of Kenya, and the economic sub-cabinet. So yes, I have brought people and shared our thinking, like I've done in other countries. I've done this with Botswana, I've done this in Malawi, I've done this in Madagascar. In different countries, I bring teams on a retreat with the president and cabinet on what best practice is looking like, mm. what to avoid. And one of the things I've been saying is that I feel challenged that after accumulating this experience through this exercise, I want the opportunity not just to advise about what should be done, but to lead doing it in my own country. So the simple answer to your question, yes, I've discussed with the President of Kenya and the Economic Sub-Cabinet some of the things I think are important for Kenya to go into best practice, to avoid the pitfalls in a challenging situation like we're in today. Have you seen the implementation of any of your recommendations? I don't want to discuss that. But the, 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 there are some significant things that the president and the government have been doing. We cannot just wish it all away. I think there's some things that they're doing that are right. OK. One viewer wanted to know which sector of the economy would you be most keen to immediately begin to focus on to create you know, jobs and, and carry out that You, you know, um, the model. fastest creator of jobs in the Kenyan economy is the services industry. You know, strangely, we think that industrialization is uh, smokestack factories. But our experiments have not borne this out. Manufacturing as a percentage of GDP is in de steady decline, in spite of manufacturing being one of the four pillars of the legacy program. And it's not because of President Uhuru's uh, uh, doing. It's just a reality that Kenya has certain competitive advantage internationally, even in the year of labor, in the services industry. And what that means is that the quickest benefits of creating employment, apart from reviving productivity and profitability in uh, primary production agriculture, and particularly small-scale <coughs> agriculture, mm. has to be how do we facilitate the expansion of the service sector from hospitality, the, 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 the accounting services, uh, online services, pre-production, production-related services, uh, logistic services, 
and post delivery services like uh, audits and uh, post service customer assessment. These are growth levers that we don't sufficiently appreciate. We have not given any ministry clear responsibility for them, and yet they are the fastest creators of employment. So to me, digitally enabled services and some of the traditional services, hospitality, entertainment services, are a major source of early opportunity for creating employment that will target. But you don't only target them. You give them the first step priority, but you start also addressing the others about what is making made in Kenya less competitive than it used to be, building Kenya's productive capacity. Katari, as we wrap this up, you've spoken about you know, Kenya's strength in the uh, labor services sector. Yes. Uh, at this moment, we know that there are, for example, over 200,000 Kenyans working in the Gulf, yes. uh, in the Arab Peninsula and its areas as well. Yes. And we know there's a lot of foreign investment, foreign income, rather, being sent this way from that part of the world. But the challenge also is complaints and concerns about human rights infringements as well. Yes. How would you balance that? The jobs are needed and are necessary, but there are concerns that for some Kenyans, they find the conditions out there not tolerable, not conducive for the work that they are to carry out. I have lived 16 and a half years of my adult life outside this country. So I have a fairly good idea of what's going on in the diaspora. I have gotten to speak to Kenyans in the diaspora at organized events, but I've also met Kenyans during my official trips around the 119 countries I've visited. They are very hardworking, but there's a certain other reality. In certain countries in the Middle East, the level of abuse of human dignity, sexual assaults, physical assaults, denial of a right of return home because you are in prison, your passport is taken away from you, is a daily reality. And I, I, I like the fact that the Kenya government has been taking some labor steps mm. between the Ministry of Labor and Foreign Affairs. But Kenya is not doing enough to blacklist recruiters of labor from Kenya going to the Middle East from cheating Kenyan laborers, particularly girls, about a paradise that does not exist. And we don't have built infrastructure on coordinating how to help them get out. The Philippines has done very well. It has the largest what is called mode force trading services and skilled and semi-skilled labor services abroad. It has the best coordination by its missions around the world. Kenya can do a bit more than it has been doing. That is important for the lowest category of persons in uh, labor outside the country. But there's another category that has different problems, which is the remittances from the diaspora sometimes are coming through vehicles that are created by criminals here. And they stifle the spirit of those Kenyans that have become the largest source of foreign exchange for the country. Can you be a bit more specific with, with that? For there example. are people who advertise online and take promotional trips to visit Amer Kenyans in America and Europe about investment vehicles for new housing estates in Nairobi. But often they are using models that are not theirs. They are using promises that are false. And they collect innocent Kenyan diaspora resources, thinking they are going to own a home in Kenya. The money comes in, but doesn't go to the purpose. That dilutes the spirit of those Kenyans involved. And I'm glad that there have been areas where government has been taking steps to do mm -hmm. due diligence on prospectors as that being sent to the diaspora investment community. But it has not been sufficient. So our collective ability to criminalize these people will reduce the waste that is slowing down one of the largest possible sources of foreign exchange for this country. Dr. Kitui, for your last word, next week at a time like this, the annual devolution conference will be happening in Makweni County. Yes. Um, how would you rate our devolution so far because one view has said this evening sustaining 47 counties it's in our law kenyans voted for it but he feels it's proving unsustainable um devolution is a great idea and i'm glad that it was part of the success story of our constitution 2010. unfortunately the fears that devolution will come with the devolution the decentralization of corruption has been borne out by some of the evidence we have. You just need to visit some areas and see the palaces that county officials have built for themselves. It's obviously a product of diverting taxpayers' money. I think tightening 
the financial management infrastructure for devolved government has to be an important step to make devolution sustainable. We just don't keep promising more money when there is expansion in leakage. But also importantly, it is true, some of us argued strongly that Kenya should have devolved into as much smaller number of units. And I remember people argued that it's a good idea, but we cannot do it because we do not trust the legal commission to set boundaries of 10 units. We'd rather go with the districts that existed in 1992, which is a less costly matter politically. So it was the first thing. But I also want to argue this way. We have built a sense that devolution is good because it is the venue, the avenue for distributing development money. And I want to repeat that question. In most developed societies, the growth is how to plan and generate resources within the county. Devolution money from the state complements the resources that come through growth in productivity and revenues of the county itself. I think we have to look in the next phase how to tie financial regulations, how to rationalize employment procedures, even the creation of exponential growth of uh, titles and positions that are given to friends of uh, managers of devolution. But importantly, turn devolution into a tool for managing development, entrepreneurial growth, mm -hmm. rather than collecting and disbursing taxpayers from the money from the center. Dr. Ketu, we are going to have to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for your time. Let me actually read you one SMS, Dr. Ketu, here from Fred Obachi Machoka. My he friend. Calls himself, oh, he's your friend. Okay. He says, content addressing issues that affect all Kenyans. This is refreshing. Please bring your guest back. This is what the country needs to be Ana umeleze Machoka, I mean, tayari, nitajaribu angalau nina msamiati mdogo. Uh -huh. Kuyajibu maswala kwa uma kwa lugha ya Kiswahili katika <laughs> program yake. You're definitely doing much better than me, Dr. Kitui. So still not telling us when the party is being launched as we wrap up? Uh, I don't think that no I'm dates. under any pressure on that one. But uh, I'm glad for the opportunity of giving me to talk to Kenyans, to share my sense that, and I have said this again and again, mm -hmm. just one sentence. One sentence exactly. We'll After 58 years of the Kenyan economy serving Kenyan politics, let's go through a transition where Kenyan politics is a servant of the Kenyan economy. We're going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Doc, for that. And you, I think you said that before the last time we actually hosted you on the program. Dr. Mohisa Kitui, former UNGTAD Secretary General, he says he's still vying. He says watch out for his new party and for his official presidential bid because he only announced that he'll be vying, but he's got an official presidential bid that he says he will let the country know about very soon. And he was our guest on Newsnight this evening on a No Holds Barred interview. Every question on the table. And thank you so much for all the feedback that you've sent to to four to two years uh, has been the sms line with the hashtag being newsnight but we must wrap it up right now so on behalf of the whole team that's made this broadcast possible uh, and of course you our viewers at home would not have been uh, here without you thank you for tuning in our sign language interpreter this evening has been jockey shege we do this every tuesday we get newsmakers um, different leaders from different spheres of society to come and answer questions that are important to you so let's meet again next week tuesday on the program my name is Wahiga Mwaura. Have a good night, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.